Is gravity infinite? Did the dinosaurs feel the effects of the asteroid before it crashed? How long would the ISS survive without support? Would potential life on K218b be trapped in their gravity well? And in our Q&A Plus edition, is the Vera Rubin telescope doge proof? Answering all these questions and more in this question show. It's time for the question show. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are across my channel. If a question pops in your brain, just write it down. I'll gather them up and I'll answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. Physius, so if in some alternate reality we discover intelligent life on K218b, would they be able to leave the planet of that size and gravity or would they be stuck there compared to us here? So I just checked on the internet and the surface gravity of K218b is about 13 meters per second squared. And if you probably remember your high school physics, the surface gravity of Earth is 9.8 meters per second squared. And so it's more than Earth, but it's not bad. It's like 1.3 G's or so. And so that would be possible for a civilization to be able to leave that gravity. Well, you'd have to have more fuel in your rocket. You would be able to launch much smaller payloads, but it still would be possible. And this is like, it's a huge planet. Like when you look at, at Earth compared to K218b, I mean, it is what, nine times as big as the Earth or something like that? Like it's big. Um, and yet that's how density works. Like the, the surface gravity is the result of the size of your planet and the density. And so as long as the size is big enough and the density is low enough, then the gravity on the surface is gonna be relatively low. And so people think, oh, you've got this super Earth, then there's no way they can escape. But actually, you could have a super Earth that's something that's like twice as big as the Earth, but maybe it only has a surface gravity of 1.1 times the Earth or 1.2 times the Earth. So don't let the giant planet uh, lull you into a uh, false sense of security. No, the, the k 218 beers could could leap off their planet and come chase us down in space or befriend us. But they get to join the Galactic Empire. Paul Wilson. Is gravity infinite? Can a grain of sand have gravitational effects on a grain of sand on the opposite side of a galaxy? So gravity is not infinite. Gravity moves at the speed of light. And so in other words, if you had a star appear randomly somewhere in the cosmos, then you would see the star at the same time that you would experience the gravity of the star. And so in terms of your example, if you had a grain of sand that is on one side of a galaxy, as long as it's been more than 100,000 years for the amount of time for the gravity to have traveled across to the other side of the galaxy, that's how long it would take that other piece of sand to experience the, the gravity. And the thing that's like mind blowing is that you are experiencing the gravity from every piece of mass that is in the observable universe that all the way out to the cosmic microwave background radiation as far as you can see with the best telescopes that we have and even a little bit farther right you are experiencing the gravity you're experiencing the gravity of the particles that were formed in the primordial soup seconds after the big bang you are experiencing this and yet and every second that goes by every minute that goes by the observable universe grows and you are experiencing a little more gravity. Now, it gets a little weird because things are falling over the cosmological horizon and things are accelerating from us faster than the speed of light. And so that gravity and the light and the gravity can never reach us. So things get more complicated. But but essentially, there is no limit to the distance that gravity can go. It's that it all depends on the amount of time that it takes for the distortions of space time to be felt by a distant observer. Virgil Tantor, what is your elevator pitch to restore NASA funding? Our modern society is wonderful because of the investments that were made in science over the last decades and even hundreds of years. There, there is just this slow building of our understanding and our knowledge. And we don't know what it turns into, that you have to just be curious and try to understand nature without some expectation about what this is going to accomplish. Whatever you find mysteries, wherever you find questions, that's what you invest in. And from that, 
we then understand principles of, about the universe. We understand different kinds of materials. We understand about electricity. We understand about the way the strong and weak force work, about electromagnetism. We understand about various kinds of materials and semiconductors and all this kind of stuff. Lasers, um, you know, and it go the list goes on for thousands and thousands of things that each of which was was discovered by somebody just doing basic research. And the universe is all there is, right? Like we are just this one tiny little planet in one tiny little corner of this vast cosmos. And yet we stare inwardly at the at our own lives and our own world and our own countries. And yet there is so much out there in the universe that we could be exploring and understanding. And so uh, if we don't understand the universe, then the universe will keep going on without us. And uh, it may very well be that there will be this time in the future when we wished we understood more about the universe. And so yeah, when you think about the various ways, I mean, what is it like the cost of cigarettes is like $1.5 trillion to the human economy. And the amount that's spent on NASA is $25 billion. And yet so many of our modern understanding conveniences technologies came from these investments. And so, you know, right now, nations spend two to 4% of their economies on science. And they spend about the same, uh, you know, on military, which seems uh, kind of ridiculous to me. Uh, let's spend less on military and more on science because science is this thing that gives us a return on our investment. So I know it's not an elevator pitch, but uh, more science, more better. And NASA is the best. You know, my opinion, money spent on NASA is, is money well spent. It's time to shout out our new patrons at the $5 level and above. Warren, Daniel, Mac J. What do you think you're doing, Dave? Yozu Blue, Tommy Stark, Michael J. Bruno, IO Intergalactica, Steve Young, and Sven Sjoberg. Join the community at patreon.com slash universe today. Conspiracy theory enthusiasts. Did the dinosaurs feel any effects from the asteroid that killed them prior to impact, such as earthquakes? Could they see it for any length of time before impact? So it really just depends on on what object hit the Earth. And if this was the first time that it came by the Earth or or not. So let's imagine like the simplest possible version, which is that you have an asteroid that is 10 kilometers across. And it is in orbit around the sun in an orbit that is very close to the Earth's orbit. And eventually, it crosses the Earth's orbit and crashes into the Earth. What would the dinosaurs see? Well, they wouldn't see very much. It would be visible to the unaided eye as a star in the sky as it was starting to approach. If it came during the nighttime, if it came during the day, you wouldn't see it that it would be hundreds of thousands of kilometers away one day before and then it would be there and it would have hit the Earth. But if it came at night, um, and it was illuminated, yeah, you would see it. And it would be this brighter and brighter star that was getting bigger and brighter in the sky. And then uh, it would like detonate in the atmosphere. And then it would be like a nuclear bomb went off. So you would see it coming, uh, you know, 10, a 10 kilometer, like you can see asteroids that are 100 meters across when they come close enough to the Earth. And so this was 10 times as big, and um, or bigger. And so yeah, you would definitely see it. But I can imagine some other scenarios. So what if it wasn't an asteroid, but it was actually a comet? Well, I mean, a comet, depending on the angle that it takes the orbit that it takes, it's going to grow a gigantic tail It would be this gigantic, enormous object in the sky. And it's getting very, very close. And it has this huge tail. And so you would absolutely see it. You know, some of the best comets that we have seen in the past, they were still millions of kilometers away from the Earth. When we saw this enormous tail that stretched through the sky, well, just imagine what you would see the comet that was about to hit the Earth. So it would be dramatic uh, for days, weeks before it actually struck the Earth. So that's like the that's the most spectacular version of the Yeah, we know that we're boned, right? But would you experience any earthquakes? No, no, like the amount of gravitational influence from an asteroid or a comet, even when it is essentially touching the Earth, um, it's not going to cause any thing that you would feel gravitationally, what you feel is the impact, 
when it uh, vaporizes, when it hits the atmosphere slash the ground, all of the debris is thrown up into the atmosphere. That debris goes all the way around the earth and then rains back down as a uh, fiery rock, which then sets the earth's forests on fire and tsunamis are crisscrossing the globe, uh, engulfing every coastline. That's the thing that you experience. And you would experience um, earthquakes when it struck. Uh, they would be very significant. But no, only until it actually impacts the Earth would you feel that. Casey Ream, how long could we realistically keep astronauts fed, watered, and supplied with air without resupply? Like right now, I'll say I don't know the answer. Like, um, but not long. Um, the International Space Station has a water recycling system on board. And this is a fairly new addition. Like for the longest time, they would use up water and then they would vent the water into space or they would put it onto the capsules as they went back down to the earth. And they installed a new water treatment system that allows them to reuse the the water that they sweat and that they breathe and that they urinate and all of that, um, all that water gets reused, it gets purified and, and, and then they can reuse the water. And I forget the efficiency, but it's like, I feel like it's like 85 90%. And there are plans in the works to dramatically increase that. And you would need a much better system because, you know, say you start with a thousand liters of water and then everybody uses the water and then you reclaim it. Now you've got 850 liters and then you try to reclaim that. And now you've got 750 and then you try to reclaim that. And now you've got 600 and, it, and eventually you're out of water. So you need to get really, really good. So the, the air they scrub the carbon dioxide out of the air and they use chemicals to do that. They have these chemicals that bond with the carbon dioxide out of the air and then they, they throw them away. But I'm sure there are other technologies that are going to try to figure out a way to grab that carbon dioxide using energy and, and break it down and turn it back into carbon and, and oxygen and then use the carbon for some other purpose and then put, pump the oxygen back in. Um, but the food, that is, that is tough. Right now, you know, how much of the food is recycled? Zero, none. Um, so, I mean, there have been experiments. There was the Biosphere 2 experiment where you had a bunch of these people on Earth trying to survive in this closed environment where they had a set amount of water and oxygen and food, and then they farmed and tried to produce everything they could. And, the, and they were, you know, they were getting sunlight and they ended up having to shut down the experiment early and, and let more oxygen in because they ran out of supplies. And the Chinese have done their version of this called the Lunar Garden. And it's, they've been able to complete like a year. Um, and so, but nobody has tried this in space. Now people have done some growing plants in space to some success. I mean, people, there's like little greenhouses on the International Space Station, but nobody is producing the kinds of calories that are required to keep astronauts alive in space, especially when they're having to exercise for hours every day just to maintain their bone mass. So we are so far like uh, away from being able to do any of this meaningfully in any realm. And yet, if humans want to go and live on Mars and live off the land, they're going to have to sort out all of these problems. They're going to have to learn how to grow all of the protein that they require, all of the nutrients, get all the water, cycle through the water, make their air. Uh, yeah, it's going to be really hard. So no, uh, like that's the part for me that often just feels the most unrealistic. When people talk about how they would, you know, they want to be able to have a city on Mars. Well, if you're going to have tens of people, tens of thousands of people, millions of people living on Mars, then you're going to need this incredible built up technology and infrastructure that's designed to reuse as much of this stuff as possible. And we just don't know the beginnings of this. So uh, for the longest time, keeping people alive on a place like, you know, like Mars or in space requires regular deliveries of supplies. And right now we deliver them with dragon capsules, you know, filled with water and air and food and toys. And when we have astronauts on Mars, they're going to have to have regular supplies that are delivering all of this stuff from Earth until they can slowly learn how to be able to maintain this stuff over time and, and live off the land. But but we just we just have no idea 
all of the technologies that are going to be involved. Dougal, where does all of the space dust Earth collects end up at? So uh, this is really cool. It's like, you know, there is 100 tons of dust from space landing on the Earth every single day. And this is just entering the atmosphere and falling down and then collecting as a thin layer. And so when you go out and you scoop up dirt from the ground, some amount of that dirt is crushed up rock, some amount of dirt is decaying vegetable matter life, and some amount of it is space dust. I did a really interesting interview about space dust falling to, to Earth, and it could have some really interesting effects. So you know, we know that that there are various chemicals that the Earth is starved of phosphorus, for example, and that if you run out of a certain amount of that chemical, then then life can't complete its processes. But there is always this space dust that is falling and collecting and building up. And so, you know, one of these ideas is that, you know, when the Earth was covered in snow, for example, there was still space dust falling on top of the Earth, and that that would have been warming up little spots and creating little pools where life could still keep going, even though the rest of the planet was under this deep freeze. So it goes everywhere, mostly into the ocean. Did you know that you can watch the same video with no ads and get a bonus question over on Patreon completely for free? We call it Q&A Plus. This week's bonus question is all about what impact science cuts might have on Vera Rubin. All right, those are all the questions that we had today. Thank you everyone who asked your questions in the YouTube comments, everybody who showed up for the live show. Now we record this show live every Monday at 5pm Pacific time somewhere in the world. Uh, sometimes it's on the Pacific coast of Canada. Other times it's 5pm for Europe. Other times it's 5pm for Australia. So you're gonna have to check when the next event is to find out when it's going to be happening for your area. Now I'm going to shout out some smaller channels. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew M. Gross, Barry Lake Roofing, Brian Bodie, Caridwin, Chuck Hawkins, Commander Baylock, Cy Nelson, David Gilton, David Matz, Dustin Cable, Evan Pro, Greg Feely, Hunt Schultz, Hudson Moore, Jay Graves, James Clark, Jeremy Madden, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Marcel Smith, Michael Purcell, Monto, Paul Robach, Ren Kaidu, Robeck, Sean Sargent, Stephen Father Munley, Vlad Shiblin, and Wolfgang Klotz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. And all our patrons, all your support means the universe to us. So I'm going to continue on and shout out some smaller YouTube channels, people who I think are doing a really good job and just aren't getting the level of support that they should or they're working on it. Now I've got one that's fairly small and then a couple of others that are sort of medium sized. So first, I'd like to shout out to Wolfpack Astrobiology. And this is a channel only 1400 subscribers. And yet he is tackling many interesting topics in astronomy and astrobiology, looking at, uh, you know, the report of life, phosphine, life on other worlds. Uh, and so sort of interesting, and they, they, they're not AI, <laughs> like it's real voice, you can go back for years. And he's been doing this for years, and yet still only 1400 subscribers. So definitely check that one out. Then a bigger channel. This is Sarah Matthews astrophotography, and she's got 35,000 subscribers. And she is terrific. She's been doing uh, tons and tons of videos about astrophotography, really detailed instructions on how to set up your gear, how to take pictures, how to process them. And so if you're looking to get better at astrophotography, uh, Sarah Matthews can definitely point you in the right direction. And the last one, also around 35,000 subscribers, and this is Dong Fang Hour. And this is people who are focused on the Chinese space exploration, uh, various Chinese rocket flights, uh, missions, plans for their lunar landers and all of that. And it's all focused on on what's happening in China. That is a big blind spot in a lot of the coverage that most of us here in the West are doing. So it's great to have a channel that's just dedicated to Chinese space exploration. And uh, hopefully we'll all learn a lot from that. All right. So keep those recommendations for smaller channels coming my way. All right, we will see you next time.